Today's sermon's text is Hebrews chapter 13, 20 through 25. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with all of you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Megan. So over the years that I've been in pastoral ministry, uh, I've been blessed to have several older men uh, who have been kind of mentors to me over the years. One guy in particular is a guy named Russ Barksdale, and Russ for many years was the lead pastor at Rush Creek Church in Dallas, which is where I served with him. And he was one of the best just natural leaders that I've ever gotten to work with for a variety of reasons. But one of the primary reasons was because he had this unique ability to care deeply about people and yet at the same time not be controlled by anxiety about what other people thought of him. He cared deeply about people, but at the same time wasn't controlled by anxiety about what other people thought of him. And that can be one of the great temptations in life in general, right? Uh, But especially in ministry, just wanting other people to like you and approve of you. And while I don't think it's necessarily wrong to want to be liked, I don't think that... I don't think we should want to be hated, right? That desire can easily become an idol to us. When I become unwilling to do what God wants me to do because I'm fearful that it will ultimately lead to other people not liking me or other people being upset with me. But I saw Russ make some decisions that I thought were genuinely brave because he absolutely knew that people would be upset, and yet he truly believed it was the right thing, and so he did it anyway. But there was this thing that he used to say that has really stuck with me over the years, even though at the time I I really didn't understand it. I was in my late 20s. I was newly married. I didn't have any kids at the time. He was in his mid-60s at that point. And he he used to say this, this little phrase or this little saying in staff meetings or if you were meeting with him one on one, and it was this. He would say, you know, the older I get, the more I just want to cooperate with God. The older I get, the more I just want to cooperate with God. And it always struck me because it was that word cooperate. It just, it seemed like a low bar. Like he didn't say, oh, I just want to fall more in love with Jesus. Or I just want to worship Jesus more and more with all of my being or something like that. He said, no, I just want to cooperate with him. But the older I've gotten, the more I get that the more it makes sense to me. He was saying, I've learned through experience that if I will just stop fighting God or or pushing back against God's will or pursuing my own agenda over his, my life's going to be a lot more peaceful. Right? If, I, if I will just go with God rather than um, being this like point of friction, then things are going to go well for me. Because here's the thing, God is going to do what God's going to do, right? Like he is fully in control. He is completely sovereign. His will will ultimately be accomplished. And scripture makes that clear. The question is whether or not I'm going to submit to him. Am I going to lay down my desires and my pursuits at his feet? Or in other words, am I going to trust him? And and that's some of what Russ was getting at. I think the older I get, the more I realize I just want to trust him because it really seems to go better for me if I will just go with him wherever he leads. 
This week we conclude our look at the letter to Hebrews, and it, it's a study that we began on the first Sunday in June, and I want to conclude with this question today, what does it look like for you to increasingly cooperate with God? In your own life, what does it look like for you to increasingly cooperate with God? What does it look like for you to increasingly submit yourself to him? Last week, the author of Hebrews uh, instructed his readers to, quote, obey and submit to their leaders. But, but that was framed within the context of everyone obeying and submitting to Christ, not just individuals within the church submitting to their church leaders, but, but everybody submitting to Jesus as supreme over everything. And that's like the ultimate point of this letter, that Jesus is above and beyond anything else that we could possibly submit ourselves to. And as we said last week, that word submit simply means yield. And we use the example if we're all driving down the road in separate lanes and all of those lanes are converging into one lane, somebody has to yield or, or we're all going to crash into each other. And, and so the idea here is that, that we would truly allow the Lord to lead in all of life, that we would yield to him. In what ways are you trying to control your situation, your children, your spouse, your coworkers, your future? In what ways do you need to increasingly learn to cooperate with him? Today's text is a benediction. It's a word or prayer of blessing as a closing, and yet the author uses this blessing to sum up uh, some of the primary overarching themes of this letter, reminding his readers of everything that they have just heard and calling them to submission to Christ. In one sentence, he reminds them of four key points he has mentioned before, as well as one new concept, and I'll remind us of these as well. Verses 20 and 21, May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. It's a prayer of benediction, but in this we see five important things. One, God is a God of peace. Two, Jesus. Jesus resurrected from the dead. Three, Jesus is the shepherd and we are the sheep. Four, Jesus has established a new and eternal covenant through his blood. And then finally, five, God equips us through Christ to live lives that are pleasing to him. Let's walk through these this morning as we examine this text. First of all, this idea that God is a God of peace. You know, throughout this letter, the author has pulled from the Old Testament. We've mentioned this almost every week, that there's some verse or uh, like point of imagery that the, the author is ultimately pulling from the Old Testament. And it's one of the reasons why we believe the original um, recipients of this letter were probably Jewish converts to Christianity because he, he mentions the Jewish scriptures so much that like if these were Gentiles, like non-Jews who were receiving this letter, a great portion of what he wrote here would have been lost on them because they weren't conversant with the Jewish scriptures. And so it's one of the reasons why we believe that this was written to that particular group of people. So he's pulling from the Old Testament constantly. One figure from the Old Testament, though, stands out because the author kind of highlighted him and mentioned him over and over again, as did we. And that is the mysterious king from Genesis 14, Melchizedek. It's the guy we have here kind of represented in this image. Melchizedek. And he is framed in the middle portion of the letter to the Hebrews. Um, and, and, and in short, the author 
declared that Jesus was a king after the order of Melchizedek, or he was a king like Melchizedek, or from the same line as Melchizedek, because he was a king without end, right? The Genesis doesn't tell us anything about Melchizedek's birth or death, and so in a sense, it's like he, he lives on in the pages of Genesis. And the author of Hebrews says, such is the case with Jesus, except Jesus truly lives on. He is truly resurrected. He is an eternal king, a king forever. He is also, the author says, a king of peace. This guy Melchizedek in Genesis 14 was called the king of Salem, this place, per perhaps the city of Jerusalem. Um, but, but that word Salem means peace. So he is a king of peace. And then also Genesis says, and the author of Hebrews points out that he was a king of righteousness. His name means king of righteousness. Melech means king. Sedek in Hebrew means righteousness. Melchizedek is this king of righteousness. So he's a king without end. He is a king of peace. He is a king of righteousness. And the author says, and that's who Jesus is. Like he is a king after the line of Melchizedek. But it might be hard to see God as a God of peace or to see Jesus as a king of peace because there's so much fighting and there's so much wickedness in the pages of Scripture. And even in our world today, there's so much evil that we see around us and so much conflict. But here's the thing. God is never the source of evil. That's, that's not at all how Scripture portrays him. Rather, he is the one who is bringing about an end to evil. Or, or in other words, he is the one who is bringing peace. And, and he's primarily bringing peace through Jesus Christ, through sending his only son. As Paul so eloquently put it in Romans 5, since we have been justified by faith, we've been made right before God by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There, there's no other way here. There's no other method for achieving peace with God. It is only through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Likewise, Paul says in Philippians 4, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind. In who? Christ Jesus. Right? So there is no situation here in the New Testament where peace is coming to us outside of Christ. Whether that is peace with God like and, and reconciliation to God or like some sort of internal peace. Like Jesus Christ is the only way that peace is coming into our lives. And so it is not remarkable then that Jesus is thus referred to as a prince of peace. And that when the angels even come and herald his birth, right? They, they declare peace to those who hear. God is a God of peace. Second, Jesus resurrected from the dead, which that's not new information for us, hopefully. We're all aware that that happened. Certainly the recipients of this letter would have been aware that Jesus had resurrected from the dead. But, but this is why we come together in large part to worship every single week is, is we have to be reminded of these truths, no matter how many times we've heard them. Like the resurrection is like the central initiating event of Christianity. Like, had Jesus been born of a virgin and performed miracles and taught compelling and challenging messages and died a martyr's death and yet remained in the tomb, I'm not sure we would be here this morning. Like, like historically, it seems to be the case that it's not just the death of Christ, but the resurrection of Christ that really initiates the church. And, and that's fitting. Theologian John Stott said, Christianity is in its very essence a resurrection religion. Like the concept of resurrection lies at its heart. If you remove it, Christianity is destroyed. Why does he call Christianity a resurrection religion? 
Because it is the resurrection power of Christ that invades our lives and makes us new. Right? First Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This, this, this hope that we have, this future we have, we have been born again into it, and it is only through the resurrection of Christ. In other words, because Christ lives, so will we. But not only that, because Christ rose from the dead to life, so will we. And that's what Scripture teaches, that there will come a day where all who have died will be resurrected, and yet only those who are in Christ, only those who have faith in Christ, who have submitted to his resurrection power, will be raised to life. We saw a glimpse of that scene a minute ago in our gospel reading, as Jesus separated the sheep from the goats, those who are truly a part of the flock, those who are being resurrected to life eternal, as opposed to those who are not. Which brings us to our third point. Jesus is the shepherd, and we are the sheep. If you were with us when we studied John's gospel, you saw that Jesus used agrarian metaphors all the time, just all over the place. He's always talking about plants and gardening and animals, and yet there are few images that are as compelling as Jesus as our shepherd. And what's so interesting is our scripture readings today have shown us that from the Old Testament to the New Testament, God has been portrayed in this way, as the great shepherd of the sheep. And, and there are a few images, again, to me that are as compelling as, as Jesus as our shepherd. My, my favorite fake Bible photo is this one, by the way. <laughs> Any of you guys familiar with this image? Uh, it's fake because there's never any point in Scripture where Jesus holds a lamb. Um, also, it's fake because, uh, despite what I thought as a kid, Jesus actually did not have milky white skin. <laughs> but what's so interesting about this to me is I, I, I kind of grew up thinking that Jesus was a guy who was constantly sitting on a hillside somewhere hugging a lamb. And, and yet, maybe it's unfair to call it fake, because it's meant to illustrate that not only is Jesus our shepherd, but we are also his sheep. And this is probably not the way we envision ourselves in relationship to him. As, as being childlike, as being frail or meek or mild or anything like this. Um, maybe the best word we could use here is the word helpless, which is what sheep really are, especially a, a, a lamb like this. You know, what's interesting is this is actually the first time in the book of Hebrews that the author has used this imagery. He hasn't talked about Jesus as, as being a shepherd at any other point leading up to this. And yet, it is kind of alluding back to an earlier point um, that Jesus is our great high priest, you see, the word shepherd that comes from the Greek is the word poimen. And it's a word that also at one point in Paul's letters gets translated as the word pastor. Jesus is our great pastor. He is our great priest. He is our great shepherd. Our problem, however is not simply that we struggle to let Jesus be our shepherd, but we also struggle to embrace the reality that we are sheep. We, we all want to see ourselves on some level as having a modicum of control over our lives. We, we all, especially as Americans, value the concept of self-reliance. Like, like we value the idea of independence, 
of, of being our own person, of having our own identity. And yet the gospel pushes back against that constantly. The, the gospel, as we sometimes say, is not calling you to just be you or to just do you. The gospel is actually calling you to stop being you and to be born again and to become like Christ. Right? That is what God is calling us to. That is what it means for Jesus to be our good shepherd, for us to yield to him, for us to submit to him. In that way, we struggle to see ourselves as being his sheep because we struggle to see ourselves as being people who have need. And, and that's not only because many of us have material provision, like we're not wanting for much in our life. We're not people who generally have a lot of needs and so if I'm a person who has no needs, what need do I have of Jesus? And yet at the same time, the farther we are from God, the easier it is for us to feel like we don't have need of him. And yet, interestingly, the more we draw near to him, the more we truly and increasingly see how needy we actually are how helpless we actually are. We are sheep who think we know the way to food and water. We are sheep who think we can take care of ourselves. And yet if we would just learn to cooperate with him, our lives would be so much better. Fourth, Jesus has established a new and eternal covenant through his blood. If I had to pick out like an overarching point in Hebrews, it might be this one, that Jesus has established a new and eternal covenant through his blood. It, Jesus' resurrection, as we said, might be the central sort of orienting or initiating event of Christianity, but it is his death, the spilling of his blood, that instigates the so-called new covenant which scripture teaches fulfills the old covenants of the Old Testament. And, and this is why Jesus' death and resurrection are inextricably linked. You can't have a resurrection without a death. And, and this new covenant that Jesus establishes through his blood is central to the message of the gospel. Sometimes the message of the gospel gets boiled down or reduced to only being about the forgiveness of sins. That, that we're all bad people and Jesus came to forgive us of being bad people. And yet the gospel is so much more than just that. Like not only has God offered forgiveness through Christ, that is true, but he has also covenanted with the faithful. He's covenanted with those who desire to submit to him. And as the author of Hebrews said in chapter 9, verse 15, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since the death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. So yes, there is redemption and forgiveness, but also now through Christ, you are heirs to an incredible eternal inheritance. And again, God is a God of peace. The work of Christ on the cross is making peace between God and man. Right? We've said that. It's bringing an end to the strife and conflict of sin. But this promised inheritance should also breed peace within you. In a kind of peace that pure forgiveness can't breed. It's, it's the kind of peace that comes from learning that not only are we forgiven, but we are being made into royalty. That, that we are receiving this inheritance as co-heirs with Christ and as children of God. That, that we're being made into something that we were not previously. This is at the heart of the concept of what some would call eternal security. It's also the reason why Christians should be curiously unattached to the things of this world, especially money. Like when I try to find meaning or security in temporal finances or material things, I am inadvertently declaring that I don't really believe I have a priceless inheritance coming my way through Christ. 
When I cling to the things of this world, I am inadvertently declaring that I don't believe I have a priceless inheritance coming my way. Or as Paul says in Philippians 3.8, indeed, I count everything as loss, right? Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. That's what I think my friend Russ was getting at when he said, I just want to cooperate more with God. It's a way of saying, I just want to more fully live out the truth that through Christ, grace upon grace upon grace has been lavished on me. And the wealth of what has given to me far exceeds anything I could hope to accumulate for myself in this life. And one final point. And this is a bit of a new concept in Hebrews. But as we strive to cooperate with God, the beauty is that it's not solely up to us and our ability or our effort, but rather, five, God equips us through Christ to live lives that are pleasing to him. God equips us through Christ to live lives that are pleasing to him. This is the author's prayer for his readers. It's a part of this benediction that God will, quote, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Equip you with everything good that you may do his will. That's part of the beauty of the gospel, that through that work of Christ that we call justification, him reconciling us to God, those who are in Christ, guys, we are already pleasing to God. That because of what Christ has done, we are already pleasing to God. But God does not simply forgive us and then leave us unchanged. No, no, no. Rather, we are also being sanctified, which means that we are also growing in our everyday lives to become more and more like Christ. And that is a work that he is doing within us through the indwelling power of God, the Holy Spirit. We are increasingly being conformed to Jesus's image. And, and this is something, again, that's not contingent simply on our effort or our ability, but it sure does go better when we cooperate with him, when we don't fight with him for control, or, or put another way, it sure does go better when we want him. A spiritual writer, Adele Calhoun, says, the simple truth is that wanting to keep company with Jesus has a staying power that shoulds and oughts seldom have. You know, what's interesting as you read through the Gospels, Jesus is constantly asking people what they want. What is it that you want? What do you want me to do for you? Like, he's always asking questions like that. And so part of the question for us today is, do we actually want him? Do we have hearts that long for him, that, like, thirst for him? Eugene Peterson, in his paraphrase of Matthew 5, 6, says, You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink in the best meal you'll ever eat. For the original readers of Hebrews who were Jewish converts to Christianity, they were wrestling with the reality of the gospel in the face of Judaism. How do we reconcile Christ with all of these other good things that God has given to us in the past? And, and in answer to that question, the author teaches that no matter how important something may be in your life, Jesus is always greater Jesus is greater. It's, it's not that Jesus is greater simply, or, or that he's greater just like more than like bad things, but that Jesus is greater than great things as well. And, and the author of Hebrews is desirous to see that knowledge take root in you and in me, guys. For us to taste and see that the Lord is good, that we would be people who deeply and profoundly believe that Jesus is is our greatest treasure and that nothing compares to him. 
and that as a result, our lives are changed as a result of truly seeing him as an incredible gift that we would humbly and joyously give him our complete obedience, our submission, our cooperation. I want to leave you this morning with a prayer that comes from the 20th century pastor and author A.W. Tozer. And this is a prayer of a longing heart, a heart that is thirsty for the things of God, a heart that desires Christ, but yet a heart that also lives in the world and recognizes that there are times where, like, I may want to want Jesus, but I don't, right? Or times where I just feel spiritually dry or spiritually distracted, and I pray that this would be our prayer this morning as well. He prays, Oh God, I have tasted thy goodness And it has both satisfied me and made me thirsty for more. I am painfully conscious of my need for further grace. I'm ashamed of my lack of desire. Oh God, the triune God, I want to want thee. I long to be filled with longing. I thirst to be made thirsty still. As David said in Psalm 42, as the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. So let that be our prayer. And so let that be our experience as well of Jesus Christ, who is our supreme king. Let us pray. O Father, We thank you for your goodness and grace as seen through your holy scripture. We pray, Lord, today that you would communicate your truth into our minds and into our hearts. Father, would you give us hearts that long for you, who have tasted of your goodness, who have experienced your grace, and who just desire to keep experiencing your grace. And Lord, for those of us who find ourselves in a dry season or a desolate season, Lord, would you stir up within us a renewal of desire? Would you make us thirsty for you, oh God? And Father, in all things, would you help us to grow in our ability to see Jesus as being supreme over everything, over even the best things in this world. God, that he truly would be our great high priest, our great king, that we would see him as such and submit to him in all ways in our lives. Thank you for your word. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.